Hello everyone, I'm Tina Kelly, the Director of Christian Education and Youth Ministry for Damascus United Methodist Church. It is my great pleasure today to introduce you to our new concept that we have going forward for our ministry in line with our goals of rooted in faith, growing in love, and branching out into the God's world. And with that in mind, we are coming up with this concept of faith time. So what does that mean? One thing it means is no more Sunday school. It's really, who wants to go to school on a Sunday? So we are building on our strengths and exploring new opportunities to meet community needs and hopefully bring people back into the church that haven't been here in a while. So what does this really mean? Faith time. Faith time is gonna encompass everything that we do. Service, groups, and I'll get into the groups in a second, missions, ministry, etc. And we're even changing Vacation Bible School just a little bit. So our groups, we are creating Faith Time. And within Faith Time, we have Friends of God Squad or Frogs. And our frogs are specifically all children from three years old to fifth grade, including those in fifth grade. In addition to frogs, we will have youth, adult, and then of course, everyone, because certain things are for everyone and not age specific. It also includes our missions, ministries, Vacation Bible School will now be called Frogs Summer Bible Fun because that's really what it is. And that is really the basis of some of the changes that we're making. Now for those children that are under the age of three, so two and under, we still have nursery. Nursery time is open on Sunday morning from 845 to 1130 so that any children that you have that don't fall into the frogs yet have the opportunity to be in the nursery. In addition to that, youth is still middle school through high school, and then adult, anyone over 18 and older, and then of course, as I mentioned before, everyone, all ages. And certain things within our faith time applies to every one of those groups. Biggest change for right immediately is frog time. So what does frog time on Sunday look like? Frog time on Sunday is really structured on the concept of vacation Bible school. And we want to take all the fun and the learning and the ways that we did the activities with vacation Bible school and really take that into the faith time on Sunday mornings for our frogs every week. We have the ability to expand and grow as needed with this concept. As we get more youth or more children, we can do other things, have smaller groups, different small groups, etc. We will have snack time every Sunday from 10 to 10:15. 10, and frogs have the flexibility to enter or exit frog time as needed. They can either stay the entire time, so come at nine in the morning and stay to the end at 11.15. They can come after the service and join during snack time, or they can leave after the service if the parents decide that they're done and they've got things they need to go to, they can take the kids out there. So here's what a timeline looks like. No change in the faith time service. It still starts at nine and ends at 10. The big difference is gonna be with our little frogs. Our frogs, if they come at the service, will start at nine o'clock with their parents, and then they'll go up to the pastor's time with Phil and his puppet of the day, and hear whatever little story he's going to tell them, and then when that's over, instead of rejoining their parents, they're gonna to go to their frog time. So there will be adult teachers here that will escort them out of the room and take them to the areas where they'll have things like story time, um, crafts, science projects, some recreation, as I mentioned, snacks. And that time frame will run from the minute from 9.15 all the way to the end of Sunday school to 11.15. That will allow parents, if you not only wanna to go to church service, but also go to Sunday school, to have the opportunity to do that, knowing that your children are not only being looked after, they're being entertained and they're being educated in a safe and loving environment. The nursery, of course, as I mentioned, is open from 8.45 to 11.30. And then the faith time is still for youth and adults, still takes place as before at 10.15 to 11.15. So what's next? September 10th, from 10.15 to 11.15, Ministries and Outreach Fair is a sign up and information session for you to come ask whatever questions you have, sign your frogs up or anything, sign yourselves up, anything else that you would like to do for faith time here at church. And then on September 17th, we're going to roll out our faith time all across Damascus United Methodist Church. And that will be the first event of Faith Time formally will be on September 17th, starting at nine o'clock with the service. So those are the exciting things we have planned. It's just a work in progress. It's going to change and adapt as we need to. We look forward to rolling out this new opportunity for you and hope to see you soon. Thank you. 
Faith time is exciting. It, it evolved during Vacation Bible School. It's going to be something that starts right here at 9.15 on Sunday mornings, beginning September 17th. And there's a brand new puppet in the family to come and be here that day to uh, introduce the children to faith time. They're going to have an opportunity to go off and do something very similar to Vacation Bible School. It's all in that video. But don't worry. If you missed it, we're going to play it again in about an hour, all right? If you miss it then, we'll bring everybody back in, and we'll play, and Ron, just keep playing the thing. Um, it's, it's an exciting time, and it, it should, we hope, invigorate Sunday mornings in September and on uh, in many different ways, just lots of options and lots of flexibility. We know that this is new for you. I know that it's new and it's different and we've never done it here before and I stole it from a Baptist colleague over in Virginia. Just so, is Brad here? I wanted him to hear that. Oh, I really wanted Brad to hear that. I did. I got the idea from a Baptist coach who's an associate pastor over in Virginia in Roanoke. If you're ever over there, look for the biggest Baptist church in town and visit it. Oh dear, that's on YouTube. That's our ecumenical moment. <laughs> That's our ecumenical moment for the day. Visit the Baptist in Virginia. We come to worship God, the God of compassion. We gather to proclaim the gospel of Jesus Christ once more. Christ, by your presence among us. We gather as witnesses that God is at work amid human lives. Glory be to the living God of mercy and compassion, and to Jesus Christ the faithful witness, amen.
please be seated. And if there are younger children who'd like to join me here in the chancel, please come forward. You can bring adults if you'd like. Uh, I have my elephant with me today, Ollie. Hello, it's nice to see you. Hello. Have you ever talked to an elephant before? No? Neither have I. I don't talk to them. They're very large. Hello, you've got a baby. Oh, you have a baby doll. Hi, Mark. Would you like to sit up here? Yeah. Oh, you can sit next to me. Hello. Come along then. Hello. How are you? Oh, she's very bashful, isn't she? Yes. Yes. This is Ollie, my elephant. He's from a country named England, and he, lives, he lived in a town named Liverpool. I was one of the Beatles. <laughs> Wait a minute, the Beatles were a, a, a band. You were in a band called the Beatles? I was in the only Beatles. You were in the Beatles? I was one of the originals. You did, and uh, well, well, hold on, get your hands off my eyes. I have to reach something there to control you. It's very hard to control an elephant, you know. Pardon my nose, I'm sorry. Yes, uh, what, did, what instrument did you play? I played the trumpet. You played the trumpet, yes. Watch this, I can play a tune for you. Does that sound very good to you? No? I think I know why you're not in the band. They did not meet my expectations. Well, they did all right for themselves. No, I, I went on to something else. I became a spy. I got a new haircut. What? I got a new haircut. You got a haircut. I thought you said I got a haircut. <laughs> if you had a haircut, you wouldn't have any hair. Oh, well, I like your haircut. Thank you. And Ollie, did you say you became a spy? Yes, I became a spy. I think it would be very hard for you to hide. Oh no, it's very easy to hide if you have ears the size of mine. Oh, you do have big ears. Some people call me King Charles now. No, oh, well, no, yes, that's on YouTube too. Don't ever go to England now. I won't, no, I won't. No, he, you were a spy? I was. Well, did you spy on anyone famous? I did. And who was it? The Elephant King. You spied on an elephant king? Yes, I did. Well, how did you hide? Well, I played hide and seek. Have you, have you ever played hide and seek before? You have? Were you found? Well, I think you weren't found. How did you get here? It's a mystery. Oh, you, you did play hide and seek. Have you played hide and seek before? You have? And, and have you? You have? Do you think playing hide and seek with an elephant would be fun? You, you're not sure. Well, I'd rather ask the other little girl. What do you think? You think it would be fun? You do? All right, I'll play with her. I'll blow me horn for you. Uh, to stop that. All right, I'll stop. Well, today we're going to talk about some ladies who were spies. They were women who lived a long time ago and they were spies. And they spied for a very special person, and his name was Moses. Have you ever heard of Moses? Have you? You have? You have? Moses. Have you ever heard of Moses? She's staring at me. I don't know what to do. <laughs> well, today we're going to talk about a baby named Moses and some ladies who did some spying for them, like Ollie, the spy. And, and for me, I'm just going to go sit in the corner and blow me trumpet from now on. No, 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 no. We're not going to blow your trumpet anymore. We'll just keep it curled up. Oh, dear, what happened? I, I think you've stubbed me nose. Oh, dear. Oh, my. Well, I, I, we're going to put Ollie away now. Thank you all for being here. And uh, you can go back to your seats now. And we'll put Ollie up here, and I'll try to get my nose straightened out. All right, yes. The Lord be with you. Let us pray. Grant me, O Lord, to know what is worth knowing, to love what is worth loving, to praise what delights you most, to value what is precious in your sight, to hate what is offensive to you, 
Do not let me judge by what I see, nor pass judgment rightly between things that differ. And above all, to search out and to do what pleases you. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Please join me in the prayer for illumination. Let us pray. Gracious God, as we turn to your word for us, may the Spirit of God rest upon us. Help us to be steadfast in our hearing, in our speaking, in our believing, and in our living. Amen. The Old Testament lesson is from Exodus chapter 1, verse 8, through chapter 2, verse 10. Now a new king arose over Egypt who did not know Joseph. He said to his people, look, the Israelite people are more numerous and more powerful than we. Come, let us deal shrewdly with them, or they will increase in the event of war, join our enemies and fight against us and escape from the land. Therefore, they set taskmasters over them to oppress them with forced labor. They built supply cities, Pitom and Ramses for Pharaoh. But the more they were oppressed, the more they multiplied and spread, so that the Egyptians came to dread the Israelites. The Egyptians became ruthless in imposing tasks on the Israelites and made their lives bitter with hard service in mortar and brick and in every kind of field labor. They were ruthless in all the tasks that they imposed on them. The king of Egypt said to the Hebrew midwives, one of whom was named Shipra and the other Pua, when you act as midwives to the Hebrew woman and see them on the birth stool, if it is a boy, kill him. But if it is a girl, she shall live. But the midwives feared God. They did not do as the king of Egypt had commanded them, but they let the boys live. So the king of Egypt summoned the midwives and said to them, why have you done this and allowed the boys to live? The midwives said to Pharaoh, because the Hebrew women were not like the Egyptian women, for they are vigorous and give birth before the midwife comes to them. So God dealt well with the midwives and the people multiplied and became very strong. And because the midwives feared God, he gave them families. Then Pharaoh commanded all his people, every boy that is born to the Hebrews, you shall throw into the Nile, but you shall let every girl live. Now a man from the house of Levi went and married a Levite woman. The woman conceived and bore a son. And when she saw that he was a fine baby, she hid him for three months. When she could hide him no longer, she got a papyrus basket for him and plastered it with bitumen and pitch. She put the child in it and placed it among the reeds on the bank of the river. His sister stood at a distance to see what would happen to him. The daughter of Pharaoh came down to bathe at the river while her attendants walked beside the river. She saw the basket among the reeds and sent her maid to bring it. When she opened it, she saw this child. He was crying and she took pity on him. This must be one of the Hebrews' children, she said. Then his sister said to Pharaoh's daughter, shall I go get you a nurse from the Hebrew woman to nurse the child for you? Pharaoh's daughter said to her, yes. So the girl went and called the child's mother. Pharaoh's daughter, and said to her, take this child and nurse it for me, and I will give you what your wages. So the woman took the child and nursed it. When the child grew up, she brought him to Pharaoh's daughter, and she took him as her son. She named his, him Moses because, she said, I drew him out of the water. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God.
Please stand as you're able for the reading of the gospel. Gospel lesson is from Matthew chapter 16, verses 13 through 20. Now when Jesus came into the district of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, who do people say that the Son of Man is? And they said, some say John the Baptist, but others Elijah, and still others Jeremiah, or one of the prophets. He said to them, but who do you say that I am? Simon Peter answered, you are the Messiah, the Son of the living God. And Jesus answered him, blessed are you, Simon, son of Jonah, for flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my Father in heaven. And I tell you, you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of Hades will not prevail against it. I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven, and whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. Then he sternly ordered the disciples not to tell anyone that he was the Messiah. This is the gospel of our Lord. Praise be to you, Lord Jesus Christ. This past Tuesday evening was ladies' night out. And it, I was wondering. A, a sizable group of women from this congregation, 19 or 20, gathered to enjoy wonderful fellowship, good food, they also learned how to cure cramps in your legs with mustard. We're going to have a demonstration of that at some point in the future. Oh, a wonderful time was had by all. And there are plans for additional gatherings for ladies night out. Made me a little nervous. It really did. A lot of police action in Mount Airy that night. I don't know. See, I wasn't sure if the ladies knew the scripture lesson for today's sermon from Hebrew scripture, but it made me a little suspicious. You see, today's lesson from Hebrew scripture highlights the effectiveness of organized, motivated women. There may be spies in our midst. Listen to this. I, oh man, this is fun. There, there may be some spies among us, gentlemen, just so you know. And, I, and I'm watching just to see. You see, the covert operations of today's text are real women. The current debate that, that biblical translators and theologians have about the historicity of Moses notwithstanding. This story of these women is an account of how God saved a nation through their daring and enterprising actions. These are she spies, and they rank right up there with the other biblical female spies and warriors, such as Deborah, Rahab, Esther, Jael, all of these actions or, or accounts are stories of incredible courage and fearlessness. Tales of how the nation of Israel was saved from certain destruction. The story of these women of biblical history is every bit as interesting as the female spies of the wars in the last century. Virginia Hall. You may have never heard of her. She was awarded the Distinguished Service Cross by OSS Chief William Donovan in 1945. But as her exploits in World War II were coming to an end, she was still motivated. And her career was just beginning. After that war, she spent an additional 16 years in this country in the CIA. She retired at the age of 60 because the CIA said that was mandatory then. Yolanda Beekman was also a spy during World War II. She was at first derided by the Nazis. 
They said of her in a memo, she is, and I quote, a nice girl who darned socks. <laughs> well, apparently in her spare time, she became a wireless operator for a resistance cell. And according to sources, her unit was dedicated to blowing up canals and the railway infrastructure in that area. She was codenamed Mariette. She was so successful that the Gestapo brought in teams of radio detector vans to track her down. She was that successful. She was arrested in a canal side cafe and she was transferred to Dachau concentration camp and executed in 1944 at the age of 32. There are countless examples down through history of female spies who changed the course of history. Spies to whom we will forever owe a debt of gratitude. Well, as the book of Exodus begins, we read a different story than we heard just last week about Joseph. A new ruler has come to power, we're told, who did not know Joseph. Now, there was a very good reason that the new Pharaoh did not know Joseph. The new ruler didn't like history. He didn't read history, he didn't study history. There's a disease about that in the world today. Well, Joseph is history. Now, when this Pharaoh came to power, it had been several hundred years since Joseph's administration of Egypt's granaries saved the nation from starvation. But in the intervening years, the Hebrew descendants of Joseph and his brothers had been very fruitful. They had multiplied. That's a good thing. Not for the new Pharaoh. Pharaoh was a paranoid, tyrannical leader. He feared that these Hebrews might rise up against him. So he turned the one-time guests of the kingdom into slaves a condition in which they labored for more than 400 years. Those at the li alive at the time of our story we read today had no memory of anything but captivity. Their fathers and their fathers' fathers were slaves and that's the way life was. This new king's paranoia and subsequent actions defy logic. His first action was he enslaved the entire population to work on construction crews. Don't get me wrong, they built some really nice buildings. They're still there. I've been in a few of them. But that wasn't enough because the Hebrews just got stronger. They kept multiplying. So he came up with a new plan. He would destroy his enslaved workforce. I didn't tell you he was very bright. This was the tyranny that was going on. And that's the backdrop for our story today. Pharaoh concentrated on killing the males, the baby boys, because he feared they would rise up and go to war against him. Meanwhile, the women, they didn't worry about wars. They focused on the preservation of life and a sign of hope. This story is not about fear. This story is about paranoia. The Midrash claims that the phrase concerning the Egyptians oppressing the Hebrews, that they, the word they used was ruthlessly oppress them. But the Midrash says that that word should be translated with smooth words. The meaning being that the people were deceived over the centuries with smooth words that made slaves of them before they realized the new status. The Midrash also questions the phrase, every boy. Pharaoh gave the order, every boy born shall die in the Nile. And the question was, did Pharaoh's paranoia get so bad that he was actually ordering the death of the Egyptian newborn boys as well as the Hebrews? Well, we do know that the Egyptians became very active in propaganda. They began teaching their children that Hebrews had no heart 
in their body that made them inanimate. That's where the seed of humanity rested for humans. By convincing the children and then the adults as they grew that these people, well, these beings had no heart, it became very simple for them to treat them as inanimate objects. Some parts of tyranny seem to go on forever. So, a Hebrew mother has a baby boy and the first miracle occurs. She keeps him quiet for three months. Uh, seriously, how did that happen? It says she kept him quiet for three months. I don't know what she fed that child. I don't know what she did. But after three months, she realizes someone's going to notice. So she makes a basket out of reeds. And, and the scripture, the, the original Hebrew is very careful about the wording. She forms a basket out of reeds and she coats it with pitch. This basket, the word basket can also be translated ark. She forms an ark and covers it with pitch. And we all know what that signifies. It's Noah's ark, it's salvation. It's overcoming evil with God's help. And she makes it out of reeds. And a little bit later in this baby's life, he will lead the people through the sea of reeds. Then she floats him in the very river in which he was supposed to be destroyed. That's when the central character of this wonderful story comes on the stage. And it's the little boy's older sister. She watches the basket. She watches the ark delivering the deliverer. It floats near the daughter of the king. The princess discovers the baby. And listen to what it says. She has compassion on him. She enters into his passion, his pain, his grief. All the while knowing that he is a Hebrew, all the while knowing that she is defying her father's own decree. And then the little boy's older sister comes forward. She offers to find a wet nurse for the princess to nurse the baby. The princess says, great idea. And who does the little girl bring? She brings the baby's mother. This is where all of the Hebrew children are rolling on the floor laughing at Egypt. Oh, the irony is amazing. The little boy is named Moses or Moshe because the princess, it says, drew him out, Masha. Actually, the word Moses is the Hebrew form of an Egyptian word that means son. She names him my son. Well, the correct translation of Moshe is he who draws out. The princess drew the baby out of the water and the child would draw the oppressed out of slavery. This is the story of four female spies changing the course of history. Each of these women had different roles in the drama surrounding the birth of Moses and each role was crucial. Without these women, nothing happens. It doesn't work. They all shared some characteristics that, well, you might be tempted to think that all four of the spies suffered from something called oppositional defiant disorder. <laughs> the acronym is ODD, odd, but well, anyway, well, maybe we can look at that from a different angle and say that they were all highly defiant in defense of their objective, perhaps courageous in their conviction to do what was right and resist the authoritarian ruler. Although defying the political regime, the head of state and countless functionaries lower on the food chain, they were themselves united by the purity of their aims. They had no knowledge or foresight that revealed to them the far-ranging consequences 
of their actions. They simply had a plan conceived for a good reason, and they executed the plan. But they had to defy authorities every step of the way. None of us want to seriously do jail time. But what would have happened to the civil rights movement in this country if Rosa Parks had stood up and given up her seat on that bus that day? Think about how the absence of defiant women would have altered the abolitionist movement or the quest to secure voting rights for women. Women like Jane Addams or Susan B. Anthony, Sojourner Truth, These women were successful because they didn't believe or behave in the manner expected of them. So how can we have a part in saving the world? Have we forgotten another form of defiance that doesn't involve protest marches or shouting or carrying banners or any other type of oppositional behavior? The defiance of love and kindness is counterintuitive. Yet each little act of love and kindness is a rebellion against tyranny, bitterness, unkindness. It's a way of saying we do not agree with the aggressive, evil, backstabbing, back-talking, hostile, and oppressive methodologies in play in our culture today. We stand against these things. We will openly and subversively sow love and kindness regardless of any perceived outcome. We are united in the pursuit of a common objective. Each act of kindness rebuffs haters among us. Each unexpected demonstration of love helps restore faith in humanity and perhaps in God. One never knows. I know that before I arrived here, there were discussions and discussions about using the church van to take a group of children to go run. Now, when I heard that much, I thought, are you serious? They want to go run? I've never met a child like that. I met children who want to sit down, never met any that want to run. And there were discussions. It was finally decided, yes, we will do that. And what has happened? Relationships have been formed. Seeds of love have been planted. And who knows what's going to come out of that? Now we're talking about something called faith time. And everyone's going, is that face time or faith time? Yeah. Go ahead, say FaceTime. That's close enough for us. Faith time has been designed by some creative women. I'm giving them all the credit because they came up with the idea to make Sunday morning an event called Faith Time. It includes worship. It includes Christian education, but we call it Faith Time. And yes, we're talking about frogs, friends of God's squad. (laughs) Thank you, Tina. And yes, I have a new puppet and his name's Bull. And I was inspired by our neighbor's bullfrog that's about that big around. We sow seeds of love and then we let God do the nurturing in the future. And maybe we hear about what came of those seeds. Maybe we don't, but it doesn't matter. We sow the seeds. In scripture, a miracle is very different from our conception of a disruption to natural law. That's what we call a miracle. A natural order of things in scripture is an expression of God's faithfulness. A sign is visible evidence of God's presence. That's the way it should be. These signs did not prove that God was sovereign. They were full of wonder, but simply evidence that God was present, like God promised. A miracle demonstrated God's presence 
and purpose. But it was never the final word. In the end of every miracle, the people have to demonstrate faith and trust. And the first thing that we must do in this love sowing career as disciples, we must not have any expectations about those things. The mother of Moses did not know whether her defiance would have a good outcome. His sister could only do her job. Watch the baby in a river. The midwives that we heard of could only fear God and do the right thing. Pharaoh's daughter could only obey her maternal instinct and defy her father to save the child. Their actions were grounded in hope, not expectations. We don't need to have someone hang a medal around our neck because we did the right thing. And we shouldn't expect to see the fruit of our labors, frankly. But we must not underestimate the importance of those little things we do in God's service. So to recap, a baby is discovered by a tyrannical king's daughter. The baby is nursed by his own mother. The child is then raised in the court of the tyrant who wanted him dead. The star of the story is a young slave girl and success depended on the compassion of the daughter of the Egyptian tyrant, whew, nursed by his Hebrew mother, educated in the Egyptian court, leads a nation to freedom. Go figure. But at the end of all that, some people ask, where was God? Because God's not mentioned in this story. Oh, they fear God, but God's never mentioned personally. God is never outright named. Instead, God is discovered. God is found in the ordinary actions of nameless women. Ordinary acts of compassion transform the routine existence of life into a miraculous action of God. Ordinary actions of compassion make possible the liberation of a people. Nameless women, routinely ignored, are the role models for all who proclaim faith and seek to be disciples of Jesus Christ. Nameless women demonstrate rootedness in faith, growth in love, and they teach us how to branch out into God's world. Amen. Good and gracious God, you call us out of our slumber and lead us toward the road of discipleship. But so often we would turn back. We would defy your call. We would find another way. We ask that your spirit rest upon us to return us again to your path. Help us be your disciples, O oh God, your proclaimers of grace, 
hope, and your steadfast love to all people. We hold before you this day a troubled world. We see violence and hatred erupt each day. It is so easy for us to throw up our hands and say, so what? But that is not your way. Your way is to call upon disciples to fulfill our calling and live out our work in your kingdom in a more effective and productive manner. So we call upon your spirit to rest upon us and inspire us this day. We lift up to you those who struggle and suffer. Many have experienced natural disasters, but others have been the victim of senseless hatred. We hold them before you and pray for their healing. We lift up to you those who struggle this day from illness and disease. We pray that our prayers will be felt in their lives. We lift up to you the doctors and nurses who minister to them. We hold before you all our first responders. And we pray that your shield of discernment and safety will rest upon them, especially in this season. We hold before you the children of our land, their teachers, their administrators, their counselors, all the staffs of schools. We pray for peace and learning. Allow our children to know the joy of developing that beautiful mind that you have given them. Watch over their teachers and inspire them by your will and not the will of tyrannical people. We lift up to you our congregation and we say to you firmly, put us to doing for we are your children, we are your disciples, and we look to you for our guidance. Watch over us, O God, and walk with us. We lift this prayer to you this day in the name of Jesus, our risen Savior, praying together the prayer he taught us, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Amen.
And I would like to invite uh, Stan and Kathy Jones to join me. There you are. For those who are guests this morning, if this is your first time with us, we like to have a formal part of our liturgy be devoted to saying goodbye to folks who are moving away. Now, you what? Or have moved away. Or have, I know, yes. I, a week before I arrived, as I was moving in my office, I was told that Stan and Kathy had moved. And I thought, I didn't even get a chance. Give me a break. But I understand you moved to Florida in a Corvette? <laughs> really? How did you do a Corvette with golf clubs in the back? So that worked. Okay. Don't need anything else in Florida. A what? A trash bag of clothes. <laughs> a trash bag of clothes and golf clubs. That's, what an attitude. I like that. You know, you, you don't come back if you want. I'll let you back in free. Seriously. I don't play golf, but still, the Corvette. We have a ritual that we like to share with you and that you see in your bulletin. And... I'm still going to give one of you this microphone so you talk amongst yourselves. The church is a family united by the common recognition of Jesus Christ as our Savior. We are all brothers and sisters. And for a time, Damascus United Methodist Church is our home. Like every human family, our church family is formed and reformed over time. As members are born, as they die, as members are adopted into our family, and as they leave our congregation for a new home in a different place. For a time, Stan and Kathy lived with us. We have shared with each other good times and bad, we have shared each other's joys and sorrows. We have lightened each other's heavy loads. Together we have laughed and cried. Together we have worshiped and praised God. Together we have lived. We feel sorry in your leaving. Let us pray. O oh God, you are the strength and the protector of your people. We humbly place in your hands Stan and Kathy of this congregation who have left us. Keep and preserve them, O oh Lord, in all health and safety, both of body and soul. Through Jesus Christ our Lord, amen. And together we offer you both this blessing. Go in the peace of Christ, our prayers go with you. Amen. And now I'd like to give you that if you'd like to say some words. Obviously, I wasn't listening to your sermon because I'm going first. But, <laughs> <laughs> but I'm just, uh, I just wanted to say this has been our home for many years and it, it will always be our forever church. So I'm going to turn this mic over to somebody who's going to say a few words. <laughs> Thank you. And don't make me cry. <laughs> it's so good to be back here at DUMC. We have missed all of you. Um, we want to thank Pastor Phil and anyone else who had part in having us here today. Um, when we left in October, it was, um, it was sad. We felt like there was not an opportunity to say goodbye and, and no closure. So just a little bit that most of you already know about us, but Stan and I have a combined total of 122 years in this church. <laughs> Stan, a few more than me. <laughs> Stan was born and raised in the church and I came to the church in 1971. 
Bob Nolan, who's a dear, dear friend, came to our door the day we moved in, knocked on the door, and said, you have to come to Damascus United Methodist Church. Uh, we were lifelong Methodist, and um, he came, uh, his mom and um, his, my mom and his wife Kay became great friends, and the rest was history. Uh, Stan and I were married in the church in 1982, and our, we, did, we did so many things in the church. We were on committees, we did um, Sunday school, attended discipleship, a lot of things, but most importantly and near and dear to our heart was the missions of the church. Uh, Stan's great uncle was a famous Methodist missionary, E. Stanley Jones. His father, Everett Jones, who Phil knew, uh, was very involved in missions locally and throughout the world, was instrumental in starting the Volunteers and Missions in, 19, in the early 80s. Um, we did mission trips to North Carolina, Costa Rica, South Africa, and our favorite, Nicaragua. Um, we, um, but most importantly, we raised our two kids in this church, Amanda and Michael. Um, Amanda and her husband, Mamo, were married in the church 12 years ago, and all three of our grandchildren were baptized in the church. Um, we, um, sadly, there were a lot of funerals in the church also. Amanda and her husband, um, in 2007, along with several other Nicaraguans, started the, uh, Between Cultures, which is a social justice organization in Nicaragua. Uh, when we moved to Florida, it was a tough move. Stan was already ready to go, but a little harder for me. He hates the cold. But when we moved to Florida, we went house hunting in Bradenton and Sarasota. I'd been going to Sarasota since 1968, and it was a second home. My grandparents lived there. And um, so we started house hunting, and um, we found a house in Bradenton and moved in in October with the Corvette and our golf clubs. And we're back here now to pack up our things. But the the hardest thing we had to do was to find a church for the first time in our lives. We had never had to stand born and raised here in me here when I was 11, never had to look for a church. There were several to church, choose from. The first one we went to was an old church, and I left and I said to Stan, the church smells old. He goes, we are old, so what's the problem? <laughs> The second church we went to talked about how warm and welcoming they were, but they were neither. <laughs> the third church we went to, oh, so our neighbor said, well, try this uh, mega church we've been going to. We had never tried a mega church. We went, but it was far from our traditional Methodist services that we enjoyed. Um, so then we found a church, and we liked it a lot in a neighboring town, but there were no missions. So we kept looking, and as Walt would say, um, it was a God incident, not a coincidence, that we found this church. Uh, it's Harvest United Methodist. We went in and listened to the sermon. We loved it. They have an associate pastor, a senior pastor, and they do a lot of mission work locally and internationally. We knew that was our church. So we got to Sunday school class, and our teacher was David Simpson, who's a retired Methodist Church from Bethesda Church, United Methodist Church, Oakdale Emory, um, several other churches in the area. He knows Phil, he knows the Yoakums, he knows um, Walt and Linda Motter and several others. So we knew we had found our church. Then we found out he golfed. So <laughs> Stan was right on board then. There was no, pro no question that's a, the Sunday school class in the church we were going to attend. So um, we're enjoying it. Stan serving on um, a committee that helps um, refurbish disabled veterans' homes in Bradenton. He's part of a men's breakfast there, and I plan to join the women's group there that Davis White leads. Um, so, so to close, we will probably keep Southwest in business with many of our trips back and forth. Um, but our friends that we've met down there, we say we're going home, and they say, well, Florida's your home now. And we said, Maryland will always be our home. DUMC will always be our church. Um, we've been um, blessed to have several people, the Yoakums, the Hoffmans, the Hulchers come down to visit us, and um, Linda Stastny came too. So if you're ever down in Florida, please look us up. Thank you very much.
This chalice, if, if you notice, looks rather empty, but in reality it's rather full. It's filled with your memories and the memories of the congregation that you lived with for so long. We pray that it be overflowing with those memories. We consider you family, and that means we'll always be together. So every time you look at this chalice that we're going to give you to take with you, I hope you think of us, and maybe you could do a little spying on David Simpson <laughs> while you're there. Definitely. Please tell him I said to do that. We will. We hope that you'll come and visit us, but you will always be with us in our heart and in our worship. So we offer this to you with our thanks for your ministry here and our blessings for years to come. So thank, thank you, you both, thank you. and God bless you both. Thank you. We have been, please remain standing. I don't want to make you get up and down too often. It hurts my knees. We have been blessed by Stan and Kathy. We've been blessed by God this day. So go now in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen.